Now we're going to talk about resiliency, which is another foundation and it's another uh, philosophy that comes in behind uh, this whole concept of positive youth development. Okay? Resiliency can be defined as the capacity to spring back, rebound, successfully adapt in the face of adversity, and develop social and academic competence despite exposure to severe stress or simply the stress of today's world. Okay? This comes from a tool called Resiliency in Schools, Making It Happen for Students and Educators. It's a pretty complex definition of what resiliency is. Okay? 15-year-old Sean says, it's about bouncing back from problems and stuff with more power and more smarts. We all get that. <coughs> right? That's what resiliency is. Resiliency is bouncing back with problems and stuff with more power and more smarts. There is um, lots of information on resiliency. People have taken resiliency training, teachers have taken it, um, educators, doctors, you know, it's grounded and grounded and grounded in research. Uh, ResiliencyCanada.ca has some great resources and so does ResiliencyCenter.com including uh, checklists and handouts and exercises you can walk through to test just how uh, resilient you really are. Okay? Everybody in this room has experienced a setback in their life. So every one of you know that there is some level of resiliency in your life. Young people need to know that they're resilient. We need to teach them that what is right with you is far more powerful than what is wrong with you. That's the resiliency attitude. That's the resiliency attitude. What is right with you or youth is more powerful than what is wrong with you or youth. And what we have to do is reinforce that with young people. Okay? This is a good point of discussion because we may know staff that we work with, either directly who work with youth or who work in our um, arm's length, you know, maybe they're administrators or they're janitors or, you know, they still work with you and all they do is pick on what's wrong with them. They stop the toilets, they do this, they do that. They, it's a negative, 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 negative. And we can pull all the way back to the stepping stone document that we talked about, it seems like hours ago, that says we can't, you know, do it on a deficit based approach. It has to be what's good and let's move forward. That's the resiliency attitude. You have to communicate that what is right with you is far more powerful than what is wrong with you. Just in itself, it's a powerful statement. Okay. Now we come to competency. Sorry, competency. I am competent. That's what he's saying. We want competent young people, right? If we're going to be youth leaders, we have to be competent at being youth leaders. Right? Everybody has a job description. Right? Okay, majority have job descriptions. I know there are probably some who still don't. That say very specifically, these are what your jobs are and all other duties as assigned. Because we all have that in our job description. <laughs> right? But then we also have, usually in a job description, skills uh, required, attributes, um, and some organizations are completely based on competencies now. Are they competent and are they good at <coughs> certain things? So the um, uh, youth development workers, we've developed a set of competencies for youth development workers. What skills should youth development workers have? And um, Marion has the handout. Sorry, I was waiting for her to cue herself. But, you know. Here she comes. Here comes the list of competencies. So now you can take a look at you. These competencies were developed by the uh, Provincial Consortium on Youth and Recreation, which is uh, um, for Conestoga's Youth Recreation Leadership Certificate Program. And basically what they are is, it, it, first of all, I need to preface it by saying that the role of the youth worker in sport and recreation programs has changed over the years. Uh, the way, at one point, youth workers were directly geared 
to providing structured programs and activities. Now it's a much bigger than that. We're not just playing basketball on Friday night. We're dealing with social issues. We're trying to find them housing. We're hooking them up with this and with that. We're, we're multi-function, multi-tasking machines is really what we are. And so this list was developed to say that, you know, there's a certain set of skills that youth workers should have. And for some of us who've been doing this business for a long time, to get a list like this is kind of overwhelming. Because if you put a mirror in front of your face and you looked at this list, could you honestly say that you have those skills and that you've worked at those skills? Hopefully, maybe there's some areas that you could, you could uh, better identify <coughs> with. There are also a list, um, there are also a number of organizations who are now using this to set up screening tools for when they go to hire youth staff. So they're developing competency-based questions, right? So if you've ever been part of a competency-based interview, those are the questions that say, tell me about a time that you, to show that you have the skill. You know, they no longer say, what are your strengths? They say, tell us about a time you made a good decision, right? So that you can display that you have that competency. So some organizations are taking this list of competencies and they're saying, let's build our questions around it, right? Um, and it really is something that uh, people have to be aware that your own organizations that you uh, work for and work with may have their own list of competencies that uh, reflect some of these or may not even be included in these. So it really is something that you should make sure you compare your own job description uh, to what's listed here. And if you want to ever move past your organization, um, and maybe join another organization, keep in mind that these are some of the skills you want to continue to develop if this thing called youth work is where you want to continue to go. Okay? Any questions about the competencies? It's really just a tool for you to better understand the skills you need to be really super duper dynamic in your job. Okay? All right. Youth-friendly staff, that's you. We're winding down the training. We've been here for an hour and a half, maybe a little bit more, right? And we've talked about our emotional limitations. We did the photo activity. We talked about the fact that we have to understand where our strengths are, where our own weaknesses are. It's okay to have them, recognize them before you walk into the room and either check them at the door or put supports into place so that you can still handle them. Youth workers, youth friendly staff know the job they are doing is outcome based. You're aiming for the five C's. We're trying to develop confident, competent, contributing, character driven, connected young people so that in turn they can become the same type of adult. Youth friendly staff understand the developmental needs as well as the assets youth need. The seven developmental needs can be evaluated as part of your program, should be considered whenever you're offering a service. Are we meeting their needs? If we're not meeting their needs, how can we include them and engage them so that we're better meeting their needs? And the assets, the 40 developmental assets by the Search Institute. Youth-friendly staff promote the resiliency attitude. We live it and we breathe it. What is right with you is far more important than what is wrong with you. You know, the kid who comes to your community center to do uh, service hours because they were the lookout while their friend broke into the shed, right? Walks in, you know, hat on sideways, pants down, you know, doing his thing. And you say to him, okay, we have you for 80 hours. There's some rules and some expectations. You have to pull your pants up. You have to take your hat off. And we're going to give you a task to do. Because you have the power and the capacity and the capability to do great things. Check and balance right there. What is right with you is far more important than what is wrong with you. You made a choice. We're going to give you some consequences. And hopefully, you know, you learn from it and you become resilient. Okay? Most importantly, youth-friendly staff want to be positive. Right? We want to be positive. We want those kids, uh, young people, youth to walk through the door and for them to feel like they're part of something, that they're connected. We may be their only connection. We may be their connection to other services. We may be their connection to um, just having a place, uh, you know, a safe place, a warm place, a cool place in the, in the summertime, whichever it is. We want to be positive people. 
right? We don't want to get bogged down in the bureaucracy and the policy and the not being able to use our hands and get our hands dirty, right? We want to do our jobs, okay? Unfortunately, there are always those things, but we have to understand our sphere of responsibility, right? I mean, we could go into lots of discussion about what youth need. I mean, developmentally, they need those things, but before they can even worry about those needs, they have to have a roof over their head, food in their belly, and clothes on their back. We all know that that's the reality, right? Am I, is my sphere of responsibility to give them those things? No, I have the connection so that I can connect them to the people who can, or they're coming to me because they now have that in place and I'm their next step, right? How do we transition? We stay positive, we promote the resiliency attitude, we reinforce the developmental needs and the assets, we aim for those outcomes so that our young people turn out to be confident, competent, contributing, character-driven, and connected young people, and we know what we're good at. We recognize our limits. Good? It's a lot to learn in two hours to become self-proclaimed experts, right? But I think the biggest thing is, you know, it's that whole, you know, think about it a little bit. The Zen phrase of pebbles from heaven, right? I don't know if you, right? Things fall down from heaven all the time. Some of them are great big rocks that knock us silly because we've learned something. And sometimes they just get kind of marred in our brain and we don't realize we've learned it until, you know, six weeks down the road when we're doing something and you go, oh yeah, I remember that, right? But ask yourself, what else or what more should you be doing to contribute to being a youth-friendly community? Are there things that you yourself, as youth workers, could be doing a little bit differently to help create a youth-friendly community? That's the question at hand. Is there anybody that would like to tell us what they're gonna do or something that they would like to do differently now that they've had some of this? Uh... Marlon. Not on a personal note, but bring back to the youth outreach workers that work for the city of Toronto and maybe put forth to them saying, you know, within our communities, let's try to figure out how we could become a youth friendly community and meet those criteria needs. So if we're not meeting it, try to meet it so we can put the application forward so we can show everybody within the communities that we work in, they're, they're youth friendly. So to bring it back to the youth, uh, city, city of Toronto youth outreach workers. And, and you know what, that's great. You know, that I think every community in Ontario is youth friendly. I said that right at the very beginning of this. We're all just friendly at different levels. And maybe it's just because we don't understand what our community has to offer that we can't define it. And what better way to start dealing with some of the bureaucratic process than to have that recognition of we're a youth friendly community. It's a pat on the back for decision makers, for politicians, for grantors and funders. It reinforces. You know, we work in an industry where we have to justify what we do. I'm sorry, but that's what we have to do. And youth-friendly communities gives us a tool to justify what we do every day. Oh, Benoit? I think what I, what I got out of today was, uh, <laughs> I noticed that a lot of our programs um, uh, use high five principles, but uh, we don't have the PYW, uh, PYD, sorry. Um, some of those principles as, as evaluation tools. So I think uh, that's going to be something we're going to bring back to our management and propose that to, to look at the, those as effective tools that staff are being trained on and also uh, because at the end of the day, the frontline staff are their part-time staff. So whatever development we can help bring to the, our part-time staff Absolutely. to work with the, the youth in the community, the better. And having the, the kind of tools that they need in training to be able to measure that and, and know if they're successful or not is going to help them and help us when we're guiding them as well. Right. Yeah. And, and just so that those in the room who aren't aware of High Five, High Five is another Parks and Recreation Ontario program that's geared to 6 to 12-year-olds. It's uh, uh, middle childhood and it's uh, quality assurance in recreation uh, settings. And the PYD, are, although it's a great foundation, you know, the five principles, they really do mirror as you grow a little bit uh, older, uh, but we wanna make sure that we meet the developmental needs, the assets, and the outcomes while reinforcing some of those principles that come from the high five messaging. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, one more. 
I guess for me, just to take it back of this, it's been great with having the youth to train youth staff, but I also want to take it back in the fact of training our staff frontline that always have that negative, um, that y when youth come in, oh, they've done that, they've done this. I'd like to try and see, even if that's a question to you, I guess, of how can we take this back to our full-time staff, part-time staff to empower those youth, right? Like in, in taking it back in that manner, I'd love to be able to try and find a way of taking this message and giving it to our staff so they don't always be that negative Nancy towards the youth are coming in and doing this, they're doing that. And I just, I want to take it back in that manner as well um, as training my youth staff, mm -hmm. but putting it onto the adults as well. And I'm not saying that they all do it all the time, but you know, you always get those couple that yeah, absolutely. that yeah. are those negative Nancy's towards, oh my gosh, the campers are doing this or the youth are doing this again. And it's like, how can I take this back? To and the you adults? wonder why they even work in the organization right. because the whole focus is youth right. and children. Especially for the why, right? So yeah. you see that as like, I want to be able to take it back and empower them to, to see them in a different light. That's right. And I think part of it is understanding the catchphrases and the words. So don't just throw positive youth development out there. If somebody says, oh, we do positive youth development, say, really, what does that mean to you? It's not develop, developing youth in a positive way. It's not making sure they have food in their belly and physical activity and good mental health and no substance abuse, which are social determinants of health, not developmental needs, not, uh, not uh, you know, intentional, youth development, meeting the needs, understanding the assets, right? It's calling those terms back to the adults who may think they're doing it, but are missing some of the gaps. And that's really what it comes back to. Ask yourself, are you in a position, are you gonna champion this, and are you gonna continue to share the message? And that's really what it's about, okay? I was just gonna say uh, to you, like we work from a strength strengths-based approach and like we have lots of material so I can even send you lots of stuff and you can talk to them about you know trying to use that approach at your organization as well so it's at and strength-based is another it's, asset it's, yeah right like it's it's just yeah. another terminology and phrase for assets yeah. so you're taking those strengths and you're right it's asset-based community development exactly yeah Jennifer sometimes it's even just reminding them that they are sounding negative Okay, call them on it. Um, I have my, my staff with the invent, inv, invention of BBM, SN, like they're all connected with each other. And they kind of got on this negative, I call it the negative Nancy kick. And I could see it playing out in the programming. So I just called, I said, look, I'm glad that you guys are supporting each other, but be aware of how that negativity and it's okay to complain and yep. get stuff off your chest, but be aware of how that affects how you do your job and how you interact with the youth and what we're trying, coming back to what we're trying to achieve and why we're trying to achieve it, the importance of it. And they kind of just go in. That's right. And you're now right. you've got and I terminology and words you can exactly. throw into that fight back to say, you're not helping me meet the developmental needs of youth. Exactly. You know, by being negative, you're not helping to build confidence in, in our young people. Yeah. Right, it's, it's that terminology. And Without being right. mean or nasty about it, just saying. That's right, it is what it is. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to the training today. If you have any further questions or um, inquiries you'd like to make, Parks and Recreation Ontario is Googleable. Is that a word, mm -hmm. Googleable? Um, you can, it's <laughs> prontario.org is uh, their website. They do have other education uh, components that are available. There are resources available that can uh, reinforce the training that you've participated in.